On April 7th and 8th, 1989, the ACLU Reproductive Freedom Project, the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights, and their Women of Color Partnership Program held a conference in defense of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is the 1973 Supreme Court decision recognizing a woman's fundamental right to choose to have an abortion. The right to control our reproductive lives is under attack. Women of color and grassroots activists have too often been excluded from the process of setting the national reproductive rights agenda. This historic conference brought together African American, Latina, Native American, Asian, Pacific Islander, and white women and men. The participants worked together to develop strategies for winning full reproductive rights for all people. They demonstrated a broad-based commitment both to reproductive rights and to coalition building. This videotape reflects some of the strategies, goals, and visions of the participants in this conference. When I have a vision for a movement, I have a movement vision of a movement that is forward-looking. I think it's pitiful that we are still fighting the struggle to keep abortion safe and legal, but we have to fight that fight. But at the same time, I want to know why we are fighting to end the basic venereal diseases that cause sterility in our people. Just basic stuff. You know, I don't want to raise a child that's going to have to go hungry, that's going to have to be poor. So I want to talk about a reproductive rights movement that talks about poverty, that talks about being poor, that talks about what it's like to not have what you need. We have got to understand and, and, and plan our agenda around the sisters who function at the bottom of this heap we are in. If that means free abortions on demand, we need to be making it for them. They're facing very, very hard times. It's going to be a hard battle. The real threat is that Roe will be overturned, and it could return the issue to the states where the legislators would once again decide who can and cannot have an abortion, where and when. But even if they don't overturn it now, they could overturn it next fall when there are three other cases waiting to be heard. It would be devastating. You don't have to be clear about abortion. Your constituencies don't have to be clear about abortion to defend Roe. Our opponents say that the only thing we have to lose is the right to abortion. They're lying. We have a lot more to lose. If we lose Roe, we're going to have a public health crisis in this country. Today, hospitals are the ordinary source of medical care for poor people. Most hospitals are overburdened. In some cities, the aid crisis has meant that there are no services available, that they're bursting at the seams. Imagine now that you go for your health care, and in addition to all those other people online, you have the women with the botched abortions and the dangerous pregnancies that haven't been treated. You go to the hospital not because you want to have an abortion, but because you've had a miscarriage and you need a DNC. And your doctor says, I don't want to go to jail because it looks like I did an illegal abortion. So he turns you away or he makes you wait until he can prove there's no viable fetus. That's what happened before Roe. That would happen again if we returned to those times. While we're all looking at the Webster case and talking a lot about restrictions, we are living with restrictions now. We do not have access to abortion services in this country. Poor women and young women have not had access for years. Have y'all thought about if in the, if in the 60s, in the early 70s, now you think about this, if an abortion costs anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000, what do you think it's going to cost in the 90s? Can you imagine it? Can you even imagine it? Also, if you think about the numbers of women getting abortions now, if this road thing goes down, can you imagine the legal or the police handling the scene that they already got with crack and drugs and all that stuff that they can't do nothing with? Can you imagine them trying to take on policing illegal abortions? We talked about an entire generation of women who grew up and became sexually active after the Roe versus Wade decision and have no memory of what it was like before that.
um, I want to begin by sharing with you uh, a few of my own memories of what it was like to be a woman in need of an abortion in New York City in 1967, which is the year the clergy consultation service on abortion began. That was a time when the word abortion was rarely, if ever, spoken above a whisper. Abortion was a shameful and secret act, which we've shared with few, if any, friends or relatives. That was a time when hospitals were the only places where legal abortions were available, and in order to qualify, two psychiatrists had to certify that our pregnancy was a threat to our life. I just decided, well now, let me do something for the profession. Because you know, in the state of Tennessee, deep in the Bible Belt of the nation at that time, abortions were illegal. So what I did is I got a little, I took that little tiny bill, you know, we had the usual bill that was in all of the states that abortions were legalized to save the life of the mother. And so I decided that I would add two things that abortions would also be legalized in cases of rape and incest. Now, I knew that's as far as I would, was going to get deep in the Bible Belt of the nation in the state of Tennessee. <clears throat> I put that little bill in the hopper. The Speaker of the House came around to the desk. He said, who told you to put that bill in the hopper? <laughs> I said, well, nobody told me to put it in there. I just thought I'd uh, do something for, the, for my profession. He says, if you don't get that bill out of there right now, this will be your first and last tour in the Tennessee State Legislature. I said, it's too late now. I'm going to see it through to its bitter end. And so I did see it through to its bitter end. And the only time I was allowed to discuss that bill on the floor of the lower house. And by the way, I was the only woman in the lower house during that term, the 85th General Assembly. The, and when it went out there, and I spoke for it, and the guys all told me what to say and what not to say, so I just put all that down and said what I wanted to say. <laughs> it came to within two votes of passing. And every, <clears throat> And everybody was shocked, but I'm going to tell you something. I had done my homework on that bill. And I'd like to tell you one story behind one banner that you may see at the march on Sunday. And the banner that I'm talking about is going to say, Jane, the Chicago Abortion Service. Yeah. Oh, yes. All right. Well, obviously, some of you have heard about Jane. Some of you may have gone through Jane. The story behind this one banner is that if you were a poor woman, in Chicago in the early 1970s and you needed an abortion, you called Jane. And Jane was listed in the telephone book under Jane Howe. And you would call Jane and Jane would tell you how to get an abortion. <laughs> and you would call this number and you would get a tape that said, hi, this is Jane from Women's Liberation. Leave your name and number and somebody will get back to you if you need assistance. And the person who called you back would say, hi, listen, I'm going to be your counselor. Why don't you come over to my house and we'll have some tea? And you would go over and she would talk to you about your abortion and she'd get your health history and she'd say, I can help you. What you need to do is show up at a place called The Front. It's just an apartment, but we call it The Front. Here's the address. Come here on a certain date. And she'd say, you can bring somebody with you if you want, so you won't be so scared and feel so alone. You can bring your kids, you can bring your mother, your husband, whatever. So on this certain day, you would go to the front, and you would see about 20 other women there. And they'd all be waiting for their abortions, and there'd be more tea and food and stuff like that, and lots of kids and husbands and mothers, and a lot of women named Jane, from Jane. And at some point during the day, somebody named Jane would take you put you in a car with about three or four other women, women and take you to a second apartment that was called The Place. And this was the place where the abortions were done. Now, Jane did DNC abortions, which is a surgical procedure, but none of the women in Jane were doctors. They had started as a referral group, and they kept referring to this uh, one abortionist who was actually kind of a sleazy guy, but he was a fairly competent illegal abortionist. And they began making deals with him, saying, if we give you X number of women a week, will you do some free ones, and will you let us stay with the women? We don't want to just send them off. So slowly they began sitting with the women, and slowly they began how to use the speculum and how to do the procedure. And finally, one woman learned how to do the entire abortion. And she shared this information with the other women in the group. Well, once the women knew how to do it, they did not need this man anymore. And they got rid of him. And they made some changes right away. The first thing they did was, until that time, women having abortions at Jane uh, had to wear blindfolds. 
during the procedure. They got rid of the blindfolds right away. The second thing they did also immediately was drop the price. This was at a time in American history when most illegal abortions were going for between $300 and $1,000. Jane ch asked for $100. They received an average of $40, and they never once turned a woman away because she couldn't pay. Jane also had a safety record that was, they never had a death, and their safety record was as good as the record of doctors who were doing DNCs for women who could finagle them in hospitals. Jane, had, Jane never had a death, and this was in 11,000 abortions. This group of women did 11,000 abortions. Now, this story has always blown me away. And the woman who I talked to from the Jane Collective said, yeah, you know, we did 11,000 abortions, and that was really important because we solved an immediate problem for 11,000 women. But what was really more important was the way that we did it, because we took a situation that was normally very disempowering for women and made it empowering. She said, this is not a story about the bad old days of illegal abortion. This is not a story about women as victim of the problem of illegal abortion. This is a story about women as part of the solution to the problem of illegal abortion. Comisión Femenil got started in 1970. I joined the organization in 83, so it was an opportunity for me to do some background and some history on my own organization. We entered the pro-choice movement in 78, very much behind the door. And it's not because we, we didn't know that we as educated Latinas weren't using birth control because we knew we were. And we knew because of our teen pregnancy rate that our, obviously our teens were having, um, being sexually active, uh, maybe not practicing birth control, but obviously being sexually aware, um, even though there wasn't those discussions. When we looked at family planning clinics, we saw that our Latinas were using the family planning services. So we knew it was an issue out there, and we weren't exactly sure how to embrace it without getting a lot of public ridicule. Um, an issue came up in 77 that most of you know, the forced sterilization rate, um, case with the USC County General Hospital. All six of them were Spanish-speaking women, women that were not educated, women that had used the county health services provided for them because they had no other medical means, no other health services available to them. When the case came up, they wanted to get pregnant again and were having difficulty getting pregnant. And they went back to the doctors and said, well, they hadn't realized when they got examined by another physician that they had been sterilized. And therefore, the doctor had chosen for them um, how many children that they can have. That was the issue we were able to embrace. It was an issue definitely in our own backyard, an issue that was in the paper, an issue that Comisión was being demanded to take a lead on. Um, we, as a result of strategizing and realizing how can we embrace this issue of pro-choice, it just seemed to unveil itself before us. We cannot take a stand on um, this case unless we have some decisions on choice. Um, and that opened the door for a, a conference. And we designed the conference over choices. It was called La, La Mujer Acción y Cambio, The Woman, Action and Change. And the whole day, it was a two-day conference, was dealing with getting women excited about making choices, choices in their career, choices in politics, choices in family, choices in childcare. So by the end of the two days, they were motivated, they wanted to go out and conquer the world, and knew that they had the responsibility on their own shoulders to do that. At the end of the two-day conference, um, we, held, we had a resolution, and the resolution was debated whether or not we would be active on choice, allowing women to choose how many children that they will have or not have. And that was the wording of, of the resolution, a very simple resolution. Um, it was a very heated discussion. At the end of the, de of the resolution, the debate won. Of the 90 people were, that were there, that was a difference of about 10 votes. So it was a very close issue, and it was a very difficult issue. And as a result of it, Comisión did lose some chapters. Um, and it's interesting to see that now that vote happened in 78, that we've regained those chapters now. And, and it took almost 10 years to rebuild those chapters. Yes. I was asked to talk a little bit about the good old days of the 1970s. And back during those times, you know, we were so radical in there. Oh, Lord, people were doing everything, and we're so conservative now, all dressed up with stockings and stuff on. You know, we wouldn't have, caught, we wouldn't have been caught dead in a pair of holes, pantyhose. We all wore 
ties and jeans. What's giving us courage is that people are finding their voices and people are finding their courage. And I think this meeting is all about that. Thank you. All of us had been involved in some way or another in the women's movement, civil rights movement, and some of us had, of course, then been led to reproductive rights. Um, generally, we all got involved, most of us got involved because of a personal experience around abortion, birth, etc. I started out in this movement long before I even knew I was in this movement because I was a teenage mother. I got pregnant at age 14. I was still in high school. I didn't know where to take this pregnancy. I didn't know what to do with it. I couldn't even tell my mama. I was eight months pregnant when I told my mother, and she hadn't noticed it. That's a lot of stories of a lot of sisters. I had that baby on April 9th, 1969. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and on April 9th, 1989, I'm organizing a march. And that's wonderful. Yeah. A few years later, because I couldn't get birth control because I was under 18, I found myself pregnant again. And I had to have an abortion. And I had it here in Washington because I was lucky because I was here in Washington where they were legal, but they weren't cheap, you know? But I remember a 16-year-old, 17-year-old trying to raise $300 to have an abortion. And how I knew, because I had one baby, I couldn't have another. Not and do what I needed to do with my life. I didn't know that that baby I had at age 15 was going to be my only child. Because five years later, I was sterilized with the Dalcon shield. So I stand for y'all, talk about reproductive rights, not because this is something that happened to somebody else. This is something that happened to me, and I've decided to devote my life to reproductive rights, because my life started out as a reproductive rights struggle, and I think it's going to end that way. So thank y'all. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this year. But first, I had to testify. Yeah. We are in every one of your communities. We are 10 to 20 percent of the population by any estimate. We are lesbians. We work in the abortion rights community. We work in all of the other communities. And we speak in our own voices, which is the important thing for us as African American women, that we have had times in our lives where our bodies have been controlled, our reproductive rights, our reproductive health, everything has been determined for us. And we come into a time now where we raise our voices to speak for ourselves, to make our own choices. It is very powerful for us to be here among other women of color and among other women in general to say that a new day is coming and a new time is coming. And it is also personally inspiring to look around and see that for women of color that we have taken up the question of reproductive rights and are prepared to educate our communities and have them understand this not just as an issue of white women, but as an issue of basic rights and an issue that for us as African American women, if we are to progress, if we are to look to the future for our children, then we must have the right to choose and determine when, where, and how. So we are most pleased to be here and we give thanks to the Creator that all of our sisters are here and that on Sunday we will be here to raise our voices in a way that no one can deny and that anyone would have to be deaf. In fact, if you were deaf, you would still hear our voices raised. Thank you. This is a rather awesome responsibility to be here for all of the over 30 Asian nations and Pacific Islanders, all of us not understanding each other, all of us not being united, all of us not being the same, and yet we have many stereotypes that we as Asian women have to overcome. Stereotypes and opinions and actions and controls of our minds and our bodies, which have been set by many other peoples, and very rarely Asians, with the exception of the few of us that are here. It's a great honor to understand that as a one Asian person from one Asian country, third generation removed, that I as just one person 
am here to represent many women who would want to be here, but who haven't been able to have the opportunity to feel free enough to do this. Today we're going to make a difference here. Part of this agenda is not only about moving women to a higher order, but sending a message to the Borks, to the Reagans, to the old boy system, to the Bushes of this country, that women will not tolerate any less than having control over their own lives. That we're concerned about the quality of life for all women in this country. The beauty of this conference today is that all of the women of color here, all of the women who have a piece of the pie in this country to make a difference, will have an opportunity to put it on paper, to make all of this a reality. In terms of what we want, number one, of course, we said we want an end to oppression. I want free abortion on demand. I don't just want legal abortion, I want the repeal of all abortion laws. I do not want the government to have any say in whether or not I have an abortion at any stage in pregnancy. We want to reevaluate the freedom of choice language. Where are their choices in a racist, classist, and sexist society? We want to reevaluate our own language of choice. Four, we want to make a commitment to addressing the needs of our long neglected Native American women. We want a constitution that includes us. We want full government funding of contraception and contraceptive research. We want same-sex couples to have full choice to become parents. We want all laws repealed that are oppressive in terms of reproductive health and reproductive freedom. I really want to rally anger in an activist mode. I really want no government intervention in the issue of the decision around abortion. What I really want is RU486 and others to be available, safe, and accessible, and I want women educated in their use. What I really want is public funding reinstated without restric restrictions. What I want is from the cradle to the grave health care for everybody. Our group wants universal free health care, including adequate prenatal care. We want paid parental leaves. We had a debate about how much time was necessary, and it ranged from um, oh, 12 weeks to six years. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we want free universal sex education starting in preschool. We want prenatal care and postnatal care. We want home births, well women's clinics, control of the pharmaceutical companies by feminist women. We want the wealthy women to buy wine. We want the wealthy women to buy a pharmaceutical company. We want women's control over women's health care and delivery system. If it comes all the way down to redefining the medical health care professional system, women learning to do abortions, and things like this. I can only fight for abortion rights when it's really embedded in a struggle for total human rights and total reproductive rights. I personally know disabled women who have been coerced into having abortions that they did not want to have. And I want to be sure that when we're talking about abortion rights, we're talking also about the rights of women to have children. I want to be sure that we're talking about the rights of people to be parents, that we're talking about the rights of all people to have access to decent contraceptives, which is something that's not widely available to disabled women. So I just want to say, I'm how happy I am for everything that we're doing and let's let's just keep our focus as well on disabled women. Thanks. In terms of my vision for the entire movement, I think we need to go back to the streets where we were, where we started. And I'm not talking about the alleys, I said the street sisters <laughs> understand there's a difference. We need to go to the streets, we need to do more protesting, more marching more whatever disobedience we feel we've got to have to get our message across. I think we've been too tame too long. I mean, understand, we have been too tame too long. And we've let a whole nother group of sisters speak for us. Is this a white woman's issue? 
and how do we take it back into the community so that we bring women of color to the table with those leaders in the pro-choice community and not in a paternalistic fashion. We need to come up with plans and strategies <clears throat> that are going to be developed in the future that from the inception include women of all colors and all economic groups. We talked about the need to include all the people who are affected in decisions at the very first line of strategy making around the table so that you don't call in the people you wished you had in the first place at the last minute and have them looking like your panel looks um, nice and diverse. Is this any different a time than previous times to bring this kind of pressure? I mean, why should these organizations listen to us now when they haven't listened to us before? And I think there was a sense among the group that this is a historic time, that this is a time when it is possible to try and start reshaping the debate and incorporating our issues in a more realistic way. Maybe we're being sort of idealistic and, be, and getting caught up in this ho sort of whole hype of, my God, this is history. But we really believe that there, this was a time when we should try and put our collective energies into transforming that and making that happen. I think what, what we are charged with doing and what we need to do, what we need not walk out of this conference doing, because we'll be back again someplace else doing this all over, is make some kind of unity statement nothing else about what we want to do. There is a real need recognized by the people at this conference and to some extent by the mainstream pro-choice organizations to broaden the pro-choice constituency. As part of the effort to broaden the base, women of color have been asked to support pro-choice activities. For example, the march tomorrow and signing the amicus briefs. Women of color, though they have given their support, have done so with mixed emotions because they feel quite often that they are being used, not really incorporated in the defining, articulating, planning, and decision-making mechanisms of those organizations. For too long, we have been mere tokens. To put a stop to this, the continuation of these practices, we will set forth a set of criteria for your consideration that should be met in order to have our participation in future activities. These include having been considered and empowered in, framing, in the framing of the issues and in setting the agendas, in determining activities, in implementing actions not only con called upon to participate with the at the implementation stage, only endorsing and supporting those organizations that have women of color represented adequately on their boards and on their staff, and that's for us to determine. Right. And supporting those organizations that support women of color in their programs. In addition to this set of criteria to truly incorporate women of color in the mainstream or else call for a separate organization of women of color concerned with reproductive rights and holistic health care. We are losing it. We don't have to lose it if we are willing to organize at the grassroots level among poor white women and women of color. But we're not doing it. But I'm telling you, until we deform our selfhood, our peoplehood, and our sisterhood, how can we coalesce around anything? Let us not think that we even know who we all are. Some of us are still real confused. Some of us are saying black women. Others of us are saying African American. Some of us don't know the difference between Latinas and Hispanics. Some of us can't tell the difference between a Japanese and a Chinese woman. We don't know those things yet. Some of us are real confused as to whether to say Indian or whether to say Native American. We don't know what to say because we don't know if we're hurting somebody's feelings. These are basic dialogues that we have to have within our diversities so we learn how to work. Okay? And I'm not even dealing along the class lines yet. We haven't even got to the class lines yet, all right? Now, how shall we proceed with this? We need to first understand 
the meaning of the word, respect for ourselves and respect for others or wherever they are. People are here because we are working for the same cause. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be in the same place. Let me say to you, coalition building goes along a continuum. And we will have to have people who are all places along that continuum. Not everybody will be here. Not everybody will be here, but neither will everybody be here. And what we have to do group-wise, organization-wise, is the same thing we have to do individually. That you will meet a woman who might say to you, I personally can't have an abortion. And she might be having baby number 31. <laughs> And you can believe that that woman really needs to have an abortion rather than have baby number 31. But what you need to do for her is respect her choice to have baby number 31. And by, and by respecting her choice to have baby number 31, she can support you around your abortion decision. That's what the crux of it is about. Because we do know she can't respect you around the decision to have an abortion unless it's available. You see what I'm saying? So we don't have to have everybody over here always crystal clear and pure on everything. Like who is pure on everything? We're building coalitions here. And we are going to have to work for issues that will lead to the end goal that you might wonder about how they will get there. Some groups will have to organize them around health in general and then move them. Some groups will have to organize around sex education, sex information, and move them on. But at least you have a place to have a dialogue. There are a whole mess of people out there that nobody is talking to. And they don't know what to do. They turned off with these crazy people. But are we talking to them? Are we waiting on the very pure? And I'm saying to you, we can't do that. We have to have respect for where we all are. I want to validate the sisters who have decided that we see that things could be different here. We have to learn to relax around the agendas. After all, we are the agenda. <laughs> and if you do that, if you work to where the people are, the affected population will let you know, I mean the organizers, how it needs to go. Trust and listen. This conference was only the beginning. We hope that the recommendations and ideas developed at the conference will be incorporated into the struggle for reproductive rights. We hope that the conference will provide a model of inclusiveness and a blueprint for an expanded reproductive rights agenda. For a copy of the full report on the conference, write to the American Civil Liberties Union Foundation or the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights.